the first thing I'd like to talk about is a process of recruitment. Okay, how do you find people to participate in these research studies? Well, every study has something called eligibility criteria. And that means who can be included in the study, but it also means who needs to be excluded from the study for various reasons. Hmm? Like, how do you mean? Uh, it might be where people live, their age, yeah. race, mm -hmm. ethnicity, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they have health problems, things like that. Yeah, and depending on what the criteria is, that's going to vary your strategy on how you find people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're looking for sick people, you can go to clinics. If you're looking for kids, you can go to schools or after-school programs. Uh, you can go to churches or community organizations, anywhere people go to find services. Sometimes the eligibility criteria can be very specific. Now, the issue with that is that you're probably going to have to screen people ahead of time to see who qualifies, and that alone could be very challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even when you know who's in or who's supposed to be out, you still have to be on your toes. For example, I was supposed to recruit 200 people from my county for a research study that also involved attending an educational program. I could recruit them from anywhere as long as they were county residents, African Americans, and over 50. I went to a senior event and I thought I'd luck out and find a lot of eligible people there. Hi, I'm Deborah. Are you Sandra? I am. Glad you can make it. Thanks. I see you have everything set up outside. It looks like we're going to have a good turnout. If I understand correctly, you're having problems getting people for your study? No, actually I'm doing okay. It's just that we're trying to get a couple hundred people. We're trying to increase cancer screenings in African Americans. Oh yeah, we're at? Actually in the whole county, right here in our own backyard. Great. Close to home. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, can you get that door for me? I'd like to set up in the next room. We can talk more sure. about it. Tell me more about this. We're trying to see if this educational program that we developed is going to increase the number of people that get the appropriate screening tests for the different types of cancers. We're targeting African Americans because they have a higher than average rate of the different types of cancers, but a lower than average rate of the appropriate screening tests. It sounds like a worthwhile cause. Gloria, have you met Deborah? I'm letting her speak to our group today. No, I haven't had the pleasure. Nice to meet you, Deborah. I wasn't really paying attention. I heard a little bit of why you're here, but can you explain it to me again? We're trying to increase cancer screenings in African Americans, so I'd like to invite the members of your group to participate in a research study. Oh, well, it seems like my drive from Andersonville was worth it. This is a research study, so it is going to involve participants taking some surveys before and after the sessions. Well, you can never have too much information. Gloria, would you like to come? You have a lot of free time. Sure. And you know we both need to start taking better care of ourselves. Yes. Gloria, did I hear you say you live in Andersonville? Yeah, yes you did. Oh, I appreciate your interest, Gloria, but this program is only for people who live in this county. Oh, she can just use my address, right? That'll work. Oh, I wish it were that easy, but I'm sorry I can't do that. This program really is for people who live in this county. Well, it was worth a shot. But Sandra, I hope you'll still join the program, even if your sister can't. OK. Well, it's not going to be as much fun without my sister. <laughs> but I'll ask Alan if he wants to carpool. Step off there, sister. You know I got my eye on him. Sister, it's all about research. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, ever, uh, did you ever stick around to see what happened with Al? Well, actually, Al ended up participating in the survey, and Sandra brought a couple of her neighbors along, too. I mean, she really came through for me, but it's not always that easy. You are absolutely right. I remember the first research survey I worked on, and it was a household survey, door-to-door, -door, east side of town. And we were trying to learn about children with asthma. And it's still a really big problem in that area, but our outreach efforts really helped that community access resources. I was walking around a neighborhood with my list of addresses and I was supposed to survey people living in the houses on my list. And I hadn't done nearly as many as I was hoping for that day and I knew I was supposed to stick to the addresses on the list. Hey, hon. What's up? No, no, I, I think I'm actually going to be a little late tonight. No, no other stops. I was just hoping to get some more people today. Yeah, I might have to wait till people start coming home from work. Well, let's see, I have... I've been to 25 houses and three people have taken the survey. Yeah. Right. Of course. I know.
Hey, fun. I think I'm gonna be home a little sooner than I thought. I knew I was supposed to stick to the addresses on the list, but I was so frustrated. So I went down to the school to see if I could survey any of the parents. And let's see, what is your address? Uh, 415 Cedar Lane. Okay, uh, how many people live in your household? Four. And how many adults? Uh, two. And that's two children? Yeah, two. And uh, does anyone in the house have uh, asthma? Uh, both of my uh, children do. You know, I went over to talk to the parents. I got eight surveys from people just standing around waiting for their kids to get out of school. But they didn't all match the houses on my list. Hey, Steve, I wanted to ask... I see you got my notes from yesterday. Yes, I did. Uh, come on in. Have a seat for a moment. Ronnie, the addresses on these surveys don't match the ones on the list. W what happened? Well, I went to all the houses on the list and no one was home. Then I saw a bunch of parents at the school and I figured getting the surveys from them would be better than nothing. I thought because the parents were picking up their kids from this school, they probably lived in the neighborhood. Some of them did live in the addresses on the list. But we only want people from the specific streets and dresses included on your list. That was reviewed over and over during your training. I know how important it is to stick to the addresses on my list. I guess I just let my frustrations get the best of me. When giving in to the frustration turned out to be a huge waste of time. I mean, we had to throw out most of the surveys I did at the school that day. I bet you'll never make that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I know how important it is uh, to stick to the plan that the researchers have set. I mean, they have their reasons, scientific reasons, for determining the number of participants and the types that they need. Um, actually, there are a lot of different reasons that someone may or may not qualify to participate in a study. When you are responsible for recruiting participants and obtaining informed consent in research, your first job is to make sure that you recruit the right people. Right. Now, rather than giving in to the frustration, I just carefully document my attempts to find and recruit the right people. It shows my attempt and it shows the researcher what works and what doesn't. So the examples you've shared so far involve recruiting people where they live. Do you have examples of other kinds of eligibility criteria? Geography is very common, especially in the community-based studies that we all have worked on. But studies can also restrict participation based on age, gender, or race or ethnicity. Yeah, and sometimes it's multiple criteria. I mean, that used to give me such a headache. Um, say you're looking for a Puerto Rican man who's over the age of 90, but who lives north of 111th Street, but south of the train tracks, and owns a small dog, but still has diabetes. I mean, now it's second nature. Yeah, and don't forget the medical criteria. I mean, some of these studies only recruit people that have, you know, certain illnesses or certain diagnosis. For example, if you're overweight or if your family has a history of certain types of cancer. So anyway, at last game, he got a double, two doubles actually, and a nice. home run. I was real sweet. Hey, they're here again today. Who's that? Some, some study going on. You go over there, you get a blood pressure test, and they give you $20. I got $20 out of it yesterday. Oh, going to go check them out. Thanks. Okay, I'll be right here. So expensive. And they cost an arm and a leg. Hi. Uh, excuse me. I was just uh, told by my friend that you guys are conducting the survey. i just looking to see be a, be a part of it. Well, yeah, I'm recruiting for a research study. Actually, I'm recruiting men who have pre-hypertension, which means you have high blood pressure, but you're not in the danger zone yet, so to speak. Good. Well, I could use $20. Okay. Well, if you qualify and you decide to participate, then you'll receive the $20 as a thank you. Perfect. Uh, what do we do first? Have a seat. Okay. We're going to start by taking your blood pressure, and once that's all taken care of, we'll go ahead and tell you more about it. All right. Okay. Just roll up you your sleeve. Roll up your sleeve. And get this nice and tight. This on, cut off your circulation. <laughs> okay, let me get this on. So, do you come here and work out regularly? You know, this has been a this is the first time in a long time. So, 
I guess I came on a good day. Okay, so far. What did you say your name yeah. was again? Uh, Matthew. Matthew. Uh, let me take this again, just to be sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Is everything okay? Uh, Matthew, has your doctor ever told you that you have high blood pressure? No. Well, yours is 140 over 90. That's rather high. Well, when it gets to 150, I guess I'll sell. No, this is serious. You need to talk to your doctor um, as soon as you can. No, I actually haven't been to the doctor in like 12 years. But this is a good thing, right? I mean, I have the high blood pressure. Well, yes, you do have high blood pressure. But according to this, your blood pressure is so high, you wouldn't even benefit from the program. In fact, you may actually put yourself in danger if you do participate. Okay, you really should make an appointment with the doctor this week, if possible. I have some information I can give you. What are some other problems or challenges you've had in recruiting people? Sometimes when you get too involved with talking to people before you know they're eligible, you put yourself in a situation where you have to tell them no because they don't qualify even if they are interested in participating and it's always difficult for me. Ain't that the truth? Especially if you've been kind of telling them the benefits of participating. They can get kind of mad sometimes. That's definitely happened to me before. Since <laughs> Since we're all airing our dirty laundry, <laughs> I will tell a story. I was working on this research project, uh, testing a weight loss program for people with diabetes. So since diabetes is very common, I was out in the community trying to recruit people from all types of different places. Are you interested in joining our exercise study? Yeah, maybe. If you have some time, I can tell you about it. Okay. Well, participants get free exercise classes, mats, weights, cooking demonstrations, nutrition advice, hats, t-shirts. Well, that sounds great. You'd also be required to participate in regular surveys, as well as being weighed, having some measurements taken, like waist and hip circumferences, and have some blood drawn. I do want to work on losing some weight, and that other stuff sounds good, too. So are you interested in enrolling? Definitely. I need you to start by filling out this form. Um, wait, it, it says I'm supposed to be diabetic to qualify? Well, yes. We have it posted right here, and I thought that... Oh, I wish you had said something sooner. I'm so sorry. I thought you saw the sign when you walked up. This couldn't it be for preventing diabetes? We're testing a program that was designed specifically for people with diabetes. They have special needs when it comes to nutrition. If you had said that beforehand, I wouldn't have wasted my time. I can tell you that I didn't make that mistake again. I learned how important it is to stay focused on, on eligibility criteria. It's hard to tell people no, especially if that person is your neighbor or someone living in your community. I ask people about eligibility as soon as possible. Then you don't end up wasting their time. And I remember when we were in the planning stages, our community advisory board members had the same questions that that woman had. You know, why can't everyone participate? Why is it only for diabetics? Yeah, and I get those kind of questions from communities that I work with all the time. That brings up another issue. It is really important that research participants and community partners understand that taking part of a research is a bit different from just getting services, whether they're health services or any other kinds of services. Yeah, because even when services are part of the package, it's the research that's the focus. I mean, getting the data. I mean, research means trying all kinds of new things, and we don't know what's going to work or not. So there might not be a benefit. And even when a program or intervention might benefit more people, there aren't always enough resources to include everybody in the study or research. But usually that falls on us, the people living and working in the community, to explain. It's our job to deliver the researchers' messages. Well, that's why it's important that we understand 
the reasoning behind, you know, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Okay. Yeah, when it comes down to it, there's all kinds of reasons why people might be in or they might be out. And we have to keep those boundaries in mind, not just for scientific purposes, but for ethical reasons as well. Yeah, Deborah's right. It's not as easy as just following a list of addresses. When it's complicated, we really need to ask those questions before we go out into the world and ask people to participate. I remember attending a training for a study I worked with with John. He was the principal investigator. This study is going to teach parenting skills with the hope of improving elementary school performance for the kids in these families, okay? So this is going to be a long-term study. It's going to last more than five years. Five years? That's right, five years. And we're enrolling uh, children who are younger than one year of age hmm, and have no older siblings and no other children even in the home. This should be easy. I found a needle in a haystack once. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I live near a community center with a lot of after school programs. I know some people that work there. Could I go there to recruit? Maybe. Are there children who are enrolled in programs there who are under a year of age? Oh, um, I'm, I'm not sure. But the program that you're studying studies school performance, right? That's right. But remember, we want to recruit families that have a child under one year of age and no other children in the family. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Most of these programs, I think, start at kindergarten age. It's important that all the children in the study are under a year of age. Because if they were all different ages, we couldn't make the appropriate comparisons from one child to another or from one family to another. We want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. Remember, we are targeting school performance, right? And this is a long-term study. So we want to see if doing certain things at home affects school performance later for the children. Like, like reading to your kids at home? That's a very good example. But in this case, we have a very specific parenting skills program that we're going to introduce into the families. And that's why we want to start kids in the study early, before one year old, because we want to follow them all the way through until they're seven years old or in second grade. Hmm? I remember being a little nervous that first day of training, a little nervous to ask a question, but I'm really glad I did because I learned something that helped me do my job better. Sometimes the information in a training session can be overwhelming. And if you're confused, it's likely that somebody else can be confused as well. Right. And once you explain the eligibility criteria to me, I better understood what the study was about. And then I was able to explain it to people when I went out to recruit participants and avoid recruiting people that weren't eligible. Sometimes, as researchers, we're so close to the material that we can't see the forest for the trees. Huh? <laughs> and we forget to explain some of the basics until someone asks. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have that someone ask sometimes. This is great stuff, guys. This is really great stuff. Uh, I still have a few more topics I want to get to, but for now, let's take a 10-minute break, okay? Okay. These community research experts really know their stuff. Yeah. They picked a good group.